I uh, find it more or less ironic to be standing in front of you talking about anything pertaining to the business side of the wine business, uh, because in spite of my notoriety as a clever marketer or marketeer, as my detractors would have it, I feel that these days I hardly understand anything at all about the biz. I'm a stranger in a strange land, in the words of my former neighbor in Bonnie Dune, Robert Heinlein. I'm acutely aware of the great, possibly infinite disparity between what you might call the Wine Speech Act and what might be called the Wine Sales Act, i.e. a flesh and blood customer actually purchasing a wine from you as a result of something you've either recently written or said. For I am, <clears throat> for all purposes, a wine blogger monkey, at least one who's not been able to successfully monetize his wine blog, qua blog, in the service of his business. I'm not a particularly successful poster boy for the mission of communicating the unique value proposition of the product I'm flogging. But presumably, that is not necessarily all or even primarily what a blog is for. For the record, I don't think that a blog is really for anything. It's just something that we do, and there are as many motivations for writing a wine blog as there are bloggers. Very, very few of us have figured out how to monetize our efforts. There are clearly much easier ways to making a buck, like flipping burgers or even selling orange wines. <laughs> We blog because in some sense we must, like the salmon around here returning to spawn. Maybe the desire to blog stems from something, comes, stems from coming from a slightly dysfunctional family of origin, where you were never properly heard at the dinner table. At least that's my motivation. So it seems appropriate to talk a bit about my own history as a wine blogger, about wine bloggery in general, and perhaps also proffer some gratuitous remarks about the bizarre state of the wine industry, and then share some thoughts about where I imagine wine journalism might go, and lastly, offer a sincere cri de coeur to encourage all of you to support originality and strangeness, two features that the wine business, especially in the new world, desperately need. I got into the wine blogging business, as it were, as an outgrowth of the printed wine newsletters I used to write and mail out. At some point, someone in my organization pointed out to me the shocking dollar amount that we were spending on postage, and as a cost-cutting measure, we abruptly stopped sending out our newsletters by post. As wasteful as the newsletters were of natural resources, as carbon footprint positive as they were, and as expensive as they were to send, I'm virtually certain that we've never quite communicated or connected with our customers as completely as we did in the day. Our Dune subscribers got something like 16 or 24 pages of faux Dante and faux Terza Rima, or sincere renditions of faux Kafka or Joyce or Pynchon, along with obligatory purple wine prose, gobs of ripe fruity metaphors with hints of hilarity subtle suggestions of sarcasm tinged with verbal notes of envy. Please don't think of me as a spy in the house of digital wine love, a turncoat to Rome, a Benedict Arnold Roberts. If I say it was the palpable presence of the newsletters in people's mailboxes that was the important metastatement, the improbable extravagance of something like a precious gift, I'm not sure precisely what lesson there is here to be learned. Maybe it, it is or was, despite the fact that my wines then were largely van de four, or, con or confections, if you will. Perhaps it was the extravagance of the prose, coupled with the extravagance of the weighty tome in the customer's mailbox, that communicated the message that I was, on the page at least, giving my all and then some. I should also mention that at the same time, we produced a minimum of 12 new and distinctive wines and labels every year for our wine club members. This was utterly crazy and impractical, and it communicated the message that we were trying harder than anyone else. This cannot count for nothing. I think 
of J.D. Salinger's character, Seymour Glass, who admonishes his younger brother, Zoe, to shine his shoes for the fat lady, to show up with his running lights on. So if there's perhaps an incidental takeaway in my somewhat frothy remarks, it may be this. We are living in a time of shattered attention spans, trivial to non-existent bandwidths, and communication with one another generally limited to a sound bite or a brief text message usually taking place at a, at a stoplight. <laughs> Customer loyalty as such, indeed any kind of loyalty these days, can best charitably be described as commitment light. But the person who somehow through all of this can express an allegiance to his customers, or in your instance, to your readers, with a certain generosity of spirit, must gain our attention and maybe even respect and fidelity. In truth, it's been a tough one for me and my company. We've conditioned our customers to expect the world from us, and now, when we're only simply delivering really good wine at a fair price, along with a modest dose of piety, it's not quite enough. So what are the lessons learned? Rebranding, as they say, is a bitch. Be careful how you present yourself, especially if you're a joker, as you may eventually not be laughing quite as hard. The initial constellation of memes that surrounds your brand and public persona, especially in the days of digital immortality, will persist to the end of your days, which of course brings up the old joke about, having, about the peril of having carnal relations with just one goat. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, I'm hoping to someday become less of a cartoon, but perhaps this may be to my own detriment. I sometimes wonder if cartoons are the only things that are noticed anymore. But I don't, want to be going, I don't want to go back to being a cartoon, nor am I particularly in favor of decimating forests so people can read my deathless prose. The lesson? I scratch my head every day trying to work out just what it might be. Maybe in the branded universe, you can't change things up too much. People like the wacky labels that we did and the putative mad winemaker image. I was a Rorschach inkblot people saw in me the person they wanted to see. As a parenthetical aside, let me tell you something that happens to me quite a bit. I do a lot of winemaker dinners, and at the end of, the, end of these dinners, uh, typically two things happen. People come up to me with a joint, <laughs> because I'm from Rasta Cruz, or Santa Cruz. <laughs> Alternatively, they will give me the secret libertarian handshake absolutely convinced that I'm one of them. Because after all, I'm, I am a breaker of rules, a non-acceptor of authority, and a dedicated colorer outside the lines. In some sense, I'm a little bit like the Peter Sellers character Chance in the excellent movie Being There. Maybe this is one depressing secret for success. Allow your audience to imagine that you or your product represent what they most want it to be. My customers, many of my, at least many of my older ones, however, are not quite ready for the latest incarnation of thoughtful and measured. Thoughtful and measured doesn't go boom, boom, like some wines and winemaker, winemakers go. And this was a little, you know, I, I actually footnote my own speeches. I don't know, this is pretty crazy. <laughs> One of the footnotes that I had written was, the la last remark is, I've observed a striking phenomenon, especially among certain highly successful winemakers of the Central Coast, who shall remain nameless, like Jim Condenon. <laughs> the formula for success seems to be to make reasonably good wines in whatever style you wish, and to publicly be a character, i.e. outlandish, provocative, profane, and excessive in one's remarks, facilitated, of course, by a generous consumption of one's own product. <laughs> maybe these winemakers are channeling Bacchus, the god of excess, or maybe they're just representing the thoroughly uninhibited person many of us aspire to be. In any event, I am somewhat in awe 
and truthfully a bit envious when I observe these characters in action. So, what are the lessons I've learned? Well, this is not exactly a lesson, it's maybe more of an observation, and maybe not even an observation so much as a fetch. I don't like the wine business as much as I used to. It's not just the crazy amount of competition we now have and the exclusionary lowest common denominator practices of large distributors. The wine business was, at least for me and for my colleagues when we started, about possibility and discovery. We were all learning and wine drinkers and wine writers were learning along with us. We could make mistakes and be forgiven. There was, like the World Series, always next year. There was an enormous diversity of wine styles, at least domestically, none of them obviously superior to one another, to another. The wine business and wine culture 35 or 40 years ago was a sort of Garden of Eden, relatively unspoiled. <clears throat> and the other the next footnote is there were still Boku bad wines. Think Latus, Blue Nun, and Wenti Blanc de Blanc. And even dreadful Chianti that came in a fiasco, the chief virtue of which was you could put a candle in it when you were done. <laughs> the known universe of wine then seemed unbounded, and this was comforting. It seemed largely knowable and navigable. Wine critics existed, of course, and their praise was useful, of course, but no one really understood then how to game the system for high point scores. It was an age of innocence, relatively speaking, where a winemaker made wine to please him or herself. Winemakers, and not merely the Walter Brennan-like old coots, would say things like, I make wine to please myself. If people don't like them, your expletive here, them, I'll drink it myself. These days, nobody says that because nobody can afford to drink his own wine all by himself. <laughs> it's too expensive. Modern winemakers live in an era of tragic self-consciousness about the economic consequences of their winemaking decisions, utterly aware of the peril of somehow falling outside the stylistic parameters of accepted wine styles. The principal consequence of the great success of the, of the wine industry is that it now seems to be about business. In fact, it's all business. Great wine was not so expensive then, and anyone who entered the business as a retail, retailer, wine writer, or winemaker did not harbor the illusion that the wine business was going to make him or her rich. We did it because it was something that we loved. But some visionary, inverted commas, individuals and companies perceived the possibility of unlimited growth and began to build wine brands and wine empires. This, coupled with the consolidation and tumescent growth of a few wine wholesale companies and mega retailers, has led to a sort of seamless virtual vertical integration of the wine business with relatively few players controlling essentially the lion's share of the game. And this is actually a pretty good mirror of what's happened to the whole world and the whole world economy. Parenthetically, it is alternately amusing and horrifying to observe how large wine companies attempt to engage with social media. They understand well its power to influence large populations and at the same time understand that, the mess that their message cannot be entirely controlled, which just freaks them out. <clears throat> the inherently random, slightly anarchic aspect of social media, <clears throat> which somehow recapitulates the, an the anarchic quality of nature itself, I find incredibly appealing and sometimes horrifying. The germ of, of an idea, a good one or a bad one, can take root and, like kudzu, take over. The key is to keep planting useful seeds and hope that some of the more interesting and viable ones will take root. But to return to the thought about these days it all being about money, when resources become scarce or threaten to imminently become scarce, we all tend to follow the money. 
The few wine bloggers who are making a profitable go of it are the ones who, in some sense, are following the money, i.e., acting as trusting, trusted advisors <clears throat> to the wealthy individuals who don't wish to be caught not napaing. <laughs> Sorry. And can't decide between this vintage's screaming Harlan, screaming Colgan, or screaming Eagle. <laughs> Forgive me, but I almost see wine bloggers, myself included, as Gene Hackman figures in The French Connection, <laughs> with our noses pressed up against the restaurant window in the rain, looking in at the shady characters inside who are eating and drinking and having the time of their lives. But I didn't come here today merely to fetch. We've established now that none of us are going to get rich doing what we do. But there's no use crying over spilled Merlot. <laughs> What's Dune is Dune. <laughs> so, if we can't find monetary gain in this work, then certainly what we must do is find more meaning for ourselves and possibly even try to make something like a contribution to the larger world. So, what can I possibly say to you about wine or wine writing that has not already been said a thousand times over? First of all, let's, since we've established that, at least for us, it's not about money, let's then talk about beauty. What voice might, be lent, might we lend to illuminate wine's strange beauty? Allow me to very gently suggest, my friends, that the compilation of sensory descriptors the shopping list of scents and schlugs, the catalog raisonné, that's a, a very elegant pun, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> of sundry roots and berries, enumerated by urban hunter-gatherer wine writers, while amusing to read at the end of the day is not particularly edifying. It just presents us with the outer garment of the wine. It doesn't speak to us of its essence, that which is cloaked beneath. Whether the nose is more Loganberry than Boysenberry, it just doesn't really matter. In fact, <clears throat> I would suggest that it's not even a question of the critic finding le descriptive mot juste for the wine. It's really about something else. And I'm thinking now about J.D. Salinger again, who in his book, Raise High the Roofbeam Carpenters, retold the Zen story of a simple hawker of fuel and vegetables held by those truly in the know as being one of the greatest judge of horses in the land. One bit of evidence of this master's great gift for the appraisal of horse flesh was that he often seemed to be a bit confused about things. In fact, he was utterly indifferent as to the more obvious outer trappings of the horse's appearance and qualities, paying scarce attention to whether the equine was a sorrel mare or a bay filly. He was instead looking deeply at the horse at the level of its essence. Somehow I would suggest, dear friends, that it is the quality of deep attention paid to the wine, looking beyond the fleeting epiphenomena that truly matters. It's believed falsely that wine is but an inert object. And the question is, how empathic of this very strange alchemical liquid can we become? The real dirty secret of wine criticism is that, is that we are all incredibly fallible tasters, fooled just about all the time, and that our own subjective states, a function of more factors than we can imagine, time of day, air and wine temperature, fluctuation of atmospheric pressure, influence of lunar and solar phenomena, our physiological and emotional states, degree of the turbidity of the wine and degree of the turbidity of our consciousness. All these things play an important role in how a given wine presents itself to us. Instead of ignoring this inconvenient truth, I'd like to see us look at it squarely in the face and then meditate deeply and what are the implications of this knowledge. I would love to see wine criticism really turn into something more like 
wine phenomenology. As we look more at ourselves and what we bring to the experience, not only to the analyticals, analytic skills we bring to understanding a given wine, rather to the changes that the wine is able to elicit within us. We as writers imagine that we are writing about the wines, but we are in fact always writing about ourselves. Even the descriptors we choose tell the reader far more about us, the taster, than they do about what has been tasted. What I'm suggesting is that the real opportunity for us is to think about wine as an occasion for meta-discussion. How can the experience of a wine teach us, what can the experience of a wine teach us about being human? What does it teach us about beauty? How does it help connect us with the natural world? Just as it is said that philosophy begins from the sense of awe and wonder, I would like to suggest that wine writing or blogging might also take its cue from the same source. Let me put it another way. It behooves us to show up for the wine. If the wine is indeed magical, let it work its magic on us. Give us supernatural powers of descriptive speech. Inspire us with, with synesthesia, with extravagant poetic tropes. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote that wine is bottled poetry, and we should absolutely take him at his word. Right now, we tend to imagine that the greatest wine is the most powerful wine. But I would like to see wine that is incredibly powerful, not so much in tannin, alcohol, depth of hue and extract, but powerful in its ability to move human beings to poetic language, or just to move us to wordless wonder. On the subject of wonder, let me share with you a rather odd experience I had not too long ago. I was in Hong Kong, in, invited to speak at a wine conference uh, and sit on a panel with the dueling Michels, Michel Vuitton and Rodin, which was a little bit bizarre. And um, Pancho, Pancho Campo had organized the conference, and this was taking place just as Pancho Gate was beginning to unfold. <laughs> so this added another level of complexity to the, to the proceedings. And uh, Robert Parker was there, of course, and he was the real draw why people had shown up. And he was leading a Tudor tasting of his top 20 selection of Bord magical Bordeaux from the 2009 vintage. And you can only imagine how utterly over the moon uh, the guests were to see him. So I was imagining that hearing Robert talk about his favorite Bordeaux in Hong Kong to an adulating audience was going to be a little bit weird. But guess what? He was absolutely incredible. He spoke out in favor of elegance, and I just had to like hold my seat. <laughs> and he presented a bunch of wines that were absolutely undeniably elegant, except at the very end when he brought out the 15.5% Cosester note. But what was most remarkable was that Parker himself, despite his jet lag and still recovering from his surgeries, was incredibly passionate and animated in his presentation. He spoke from a position of humble reverence, sincerely grateful to have been given the opportunity to taste these remarkable wines. In some sense, you could say that he was the least jaded palate in the room. He was really something. He allowed the wines to nourish him and inspire him. And this is a lesson we can all take away. There is still a tremendous amount of work to be done. We have to recover our curiosity and recharge our passion, or find it in the first place, for the wines that rock our world. And most importantly, we have to discover or create a language that will translate beyond our own private solipsistic sensorium and connect to the life experience of our readership, ideally a readership still in the process of discovery. We, who are utterly wine immersed, thoroughly macerated, you might say, <laughs> tend to live in something like a fairly self-referential universe, if we haven't noticed. A thorny problem, how to allow the ripples to spread to a wider readership without diluting the message and rendering it banal. Here's a crazy idea, pay more attention to the language. 
It's language, after all, that we're trading in. We can't, as much as we might want to, taste the wine with another's palate. We can, however, lovingly offer up our words for their delectation. We need to speak up on behalf, and forgive me if this is a little self-serving, for those who are innovating new styles or preserving something precious, an old style, an old variety, respecting the authority of a great terroir. The reality is that with the consolidation of wholesale and the gradual disappearance of fine wine retailers every day, great and maybe even very good producers are losing access to markets. We have to speak up for those wines that don't have goofy, eye-catching labels, flavor profiles that are not squarely down the middle of the road and will never be floor stacked in Safeways. Most importantly, we must realize that despite the essential, almost Sisyphean absurdity of what we do, the format of the wine blog is perhaps the perfect form for wine writing. The act of opening a bottle is typically something that is done with a certain degree of spontaneity. All you need is a corkscrew, or sometimes if the winemaker has had the wit to seal his bottle with a screw cap, you don't even need that. But you open the thing up in the privacy of your own home, and suddenly you find yourself in the midst of a great wild adventure, or maybe if it's, it's just a pleasant walk in the park. But wine, when it is great, is all about the long form, as a wine blog can be as well. It, the wine I'm talking about now, wanders like a meandering river. It doesn't have to make a point, or points for that matter. It's just there to transport us to a slightly different reality, as I hope we can do with our words. Thank you very much. In your career, if you could do something different, what would it be? That's, that's a really good question. I pretty much ask myself that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just the neurotic in me. You know, um, I would have to be a slightly different person. I, I probably would, um, you know, I don't think I had the wit, the maturity, uh, the wisdom to pursue Van de Terroir when I was 20 years younger. I wish I had, although it's kind of would have been an impossibility. But I think this distraction of making um, uh, mass merchandise wines, I think that was sort of a, a, a big distraction and that was kind of a, a big chunk of my life that I'd rather take back if I could. Other questions? Randall, you were speaking sort of wistfully about having that reputation as sort of the court gesture of wine. Right. Um, as though you're tired of it um, and maybe regret having developed it. Is that the case? Yes. Why? Um, well, on my tombstone, the epitaph will say, this time I'm serious. <laughs> you know, it, as I said, it's like, I'm the boy who cried everything. I'm the boy who cried terroir. And it's very hard to be taken seriously if, if people think you're just messing around. And um, I am really serious. I mean, I'm not that serious, but I, I am serious at least about pursuing Van de Terroir. I mean, this is something that is, for me, the most important thing. And I I'm, uh, regret the fact that perhaps some images or memes uh, of my earlier incarnation might, might interfere with that uh, perception. As a producer of Oregon wine, I know that Bonnie Dude got its start uh, for your passion for Pinot Noir. Right. I remember seeing some old bottles of Bonnie Dude Bethel Heights Vineyard Pinot yep. from the mid-80s. So when are you coming back to recapture the terroir of, uh, of Oregon? Well, I've never left, in fact. In an alternative avatar, I'm still here. I've always been here. Well, I know you're here now. Yeah, no, but seriously, in, 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 an, in an alternative universe, I would have been a Pinot Noir maker in Oregon. But you, I can only have one 
really dominant avatar. So and that's been, it was just sort of, a, a, you know, a coin toss and I chose California, but it could easily have been Portlandia. <laughs> uh, Randall, I heard you came to Atlanta last year and I heard you speak at a restaurant. You were talking about uh, wines of terroir versus wines of effort. And I've had this argument with many folks uh, that say terroir doesn't exist everywhere. Those people are foolish. Okay. That, that was going to be my question. Actually. Well, I mean, terroir, it's kind of a bit of a metaphysical question. Terroir, in a sense, is tautological. Everything has terroir. Some terroirs are more expressive and more interesting than others. And then the other question is, it's a little bit like the, the tree falling in the forest. If you make a wine and you've obscured the terroir, is the terroir actually there? Well, it's there. You've just trashed it. But it's there, or it can be. If you grow grapes with drip irrigation, for example, you pretty much negate the possibility of the expression of terroir. So it's maybe all around us, we're just, we're just obscuring it. I have a question, Randall. Um, how would you like to be remembered in the wine industry? Um, not as a wine marketer. As my, not as a popularizer of screw caps. Um, Although that's probably what's going to happen. I think um, possibly as, I mean, I really want to, whether, it doesn't matter how I'm, how I'm remembered, what's important is that when I'm breathing my last breath, I really feel that I gave it the old college try as far as, as, as pursuing a vin de terroir. Whether I succeed or, or not, it doesn't really matter, but I really want to feel that I've given it my sincere effort. If you could step back in time, what would be your epiphany wine from California or the U.S. and one foreign epiphany wine? Really tough. Um, okay, the foreign one, that's pro probably pretty easy. That would be the 1947 Moussigny Comte de Vogue out of Magnum. That, that definitely was it. Um, <laughs> And then, um, as far as the domestic wine, you know, there's all these kind of strange things that go on around us to, of which we are oblivious. For example, when I started, I think I was still a student at Davis, um, I went to go see this guy in Soquel, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, called Dan Wheeler, who had a winery called Nicasio Cellars. And this guy was kind of like the zealot of the wine business. I mean, nobody knew who he was, but he was kind of everywhere. He, he was the missing link between Martin Ray and David Bruce and Ken Burnap, and he was kind of informed all of their, their work. And he was a tiny little producer, and he, um, he was a do-it-yourselfer, and he dug a cave for himself, and he made his little, little cellar in his cave, and he had wines um, that he was aging in demijohns, for 25 years, and they were still there when I got there. So I tasted wines um, from his uh, cellar that were 25 years old that tasted like they were three or four year old wines. They were fresh, they were vibrant, and this really gave me some sense that they're A, Demijohn's a really interesting way of aging wine, but secondly, you could produce wines in the new world that actually had something like this quality of immortality or at least incredible vital life force. So I think that sort of encouraged me that things could be amazing, at least in uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains. We talked a lot about uh, perception of you, <laughs> and and then you, you're really strongly behind this, this notion of creating events at WOW. Do you think what people think about you actually matters if the goal is just Van Dale Wow? Like, why do we care so much about the image? Why do we care so much about? About our image. What, why are well, we I so don't, I don't care about the image. I truly, <laughs> I truly don't care. I, I just need some, a few people to buy the wine. That, that's, <laughs> so that's really kind of yeah. and, and So it is. At it's coming down to like, it's the, it's the sales. It's, At some point, yeah. somebody's got to you know, some, some money has to change hands at some point. <laughs> yeah. 
but well, thank you all so much.